Hey, Jeff. Hey, here. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Jeff, we seem to be on our phones pretty much all the time, I think, at home. Yeah, I keep getting these fucking remind. Oh, my oh, mom's listening. Oh. I keep getting these freaking reminders. <laughs> saying what? Saying... Don't curse. <laughs> Saying, like, how much I use my phone. Oh, the weekly screen report. Yeah, the weekly screen report. Does that make you feel good or bad? Freak that. Because <laughs> let me tell you, that thing tells me that I'm on my phone, like, 11 hours a day. <laughs> do, do you believe it? And when I'm not on the phone, I'm on my computer. Well, how are your eyes? They were really bad at the beginning of this, but now we've been taking walks and doing yoga, and yeah. I feel like that's... You've that's strengthened a, your yeah. eyes with the yoga? <laughs> I'm, it's a it's a brief 30 minutes that I'm not on my phone. Do you, Jeff, uh, feel like the phone is intrusive at this point? Do I feel like it's intrusive? Because I'll say this. Mm-hmm. The phone is now very much predicting what I'm thinking, I feel like. Okay, I've, well, you have to understand, people out there, that Eric has always thought that his computer can read his eyesight yeah the, or the phone can read your eyesight more than the computer but yeah the phone you know knows where my eyes are going and predicts then what i want to see which is incorrect okay. like I, I just want to like be like completely transparent yeah you sound like a psycho okay yeah that's fine yeah we all sound like psychos these days at least i'm with great company you know yeah good <laughs> Well, okay, so you don't believe this. I do not believe that the phone can read your eyesight mm-hmm. and also that it doesn't, like, hear things. You don't think so? I do not think so. I think my Apple TV is listening to me, like, 100%. I'm not even joking. I think that there's something in there that knows that we've been talking about Disneyland, and all of a sudden, it's like, you should watch Disneyland YouTube stuff. Or it's like we've been talking about alchemist amongst ourselves mm-hmm. and then and it's like the book shows up and it says no hey. not, not, not yeah maybe <laughs> amazon's like do you mean the alchemist <laughs> book it's like no 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 no. we're talking about the producer alchemist how many times do we have to explain this and then it sends you a bob deep album and you're like <laughs> great thank you i really do believe that do you that it that it hears what i'm saying no okay i wish it was because then our numbers would be well how do you much explain higher. It? how do you explain it I don't know. Weird coincidences. Well, you you believe that your cookies are sort of uh, helping this this go along, right? You can't say it like that. How do you say it? On my phone, yeah, there are cookies. Yeah, not my cookies. <laughs> I believe are that part of a conspiracy theory. <laughs> like I'm baking shout out cookies. to West Side Market. <laughs> yeah, uh, I do enjoy chocolate chip cookies. If you want to send them to us, uh, you can send them to the same address as our Alchemist book is going. <laughs> But um, Amazon, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, yes. Cookies are the things that track the websites you go to yeah. on all of your, uh, you know, computer, phone, whatever. Do you erase them? I do, and I have a, I have a private. Um, well, Jeff, why do you erase them? Do you on feel my phone? Like your phone is listening to you. No, well, the data, yes, but not oh. audibly listening. Hold to on, me. no, Hold this on. isn't proving your point. This is the phone listens to you. It doesn't watch you. Got it. The phone <laughs> understands what websites you go to, and based off that, it serves you advertising. I think we all understand that. Great. Now, you know what's crazy? <laughs> Me stating facts sounds like a conspiracy theory. I'm like, we all know that the phone is tracking us. Yeah. Yes, the phone is tracking us because you turn on cookies, but. Because I have turned on cookies, I can't do the thing I want to do, which is I want to play this crossword game. How does your phone stop Times. you from playing the crossword game? Because if you input your information and you keep that web page open, mm-hmm. because there's not a, a singular app for this crossword game that the New York Times does. Okay, let me let me back the, up. I thought the New York Times had a crossword there's app. There's a New York Times crossword app, but they also have games that fall under the crossword category, even though they are not necessarily themselves crosswords. And they're not available in the app? And they're not available in the app. They're only available on a website. And so you have to keep your password in there. Yeah. And in order to do that, you have to enable cookies. And I don't want to do that. And so I stopped playing the game that I really enjoy. And so now... All I'm trying to say is quarantine is bad, yeah. and I don't <laughs> like it. I wish I could. I wish I could play the game I want to play. <laughs> Jeff, who's on the podcast today? We've lost everybody by now. Yeah, doesn't even matter. Okay, we. 
Larry Wilmore's on the podcast. <laughs> Shout out to Larry Wilmore. You know him from the Nightly Show. Mm-hmm. You know him from the Daily Show. Mm-hmm. You know him from The Office. Yep. You know him from uh, Insecure. You know him from being one of the great TV producers, creators, uh, blackish. Uh, he is just a, a powerhouse out there in uh, Hollywood. But also just like super funny, super, super brilliant. smart. Yeah. He's a great dude. This yeah. was a real coup for us. Like, it was awesome to get Larry Wilmore, who is also one of the busiest people in Hollywood, uh, on the phone for a great conversation. Uh, this was this was really awesome. Shout out to Larry Wilmore. Yeah, we also have Sylvia Obell on the podcast. Shout out to our friend Sylvia out there in Brooklyn. Man, uh, she has a really, really cool new podcast with uh, Scotty Beam, mm-hmm. Diani Scott. Um, that's over on Netflix. And uh, But also, this is a conversation that we've been looking forward to having for a long time. Absolutely. She's a fantastic personality. She is a ton of energy. She is one of the smartest people that we know. It is great to uh, sit down over the phone with her, even yeah. if we can't have her sitting here in our apartment. By the way, I was telling our brother Dan yesterday, I was like, oh, we have a, you know this person, this person, this person on the podcast. And I was like, I don't know if you know Sylvia. He was like, I know everything about Sylvia. <laughs> Well, now he's like, I know know she has her show. Now he's going to know a little bit more about her. He's like, I know we ran into her at this party. It is a pleasure to uh, speak with Sylvia. As always, shout out to Sylvia. Yes, we also have Kev of the On Stage family. That's right. The leader of the On Stages, Kev On Stage, um, one of the most popular touring, uh, I was going to say musicians, then I was going to say magicians. He's not either one. I think that he's a magician. He. He is a comedian, yeah, and he's one of the most what, popular touring comedians. What tricks have you seen him do, Jeff? Let's save that for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, traces my cookies. <laughs> Shout out to Kev on stage. We talk about basically how to hold on to a uh, a fan base during this whole uh, global pandemic. We talk about his efforts to uh, be an essential worker at home. Um, because or his, lack thereof. You know, his wife is doing most of the work, and then Mrs. Kev on stage. Kev is there, yeah. to provide uh, emotional support and applaud his children and uh, provide some laughs at home. And we talk about what it's like to uh, reorganize your life and wake up with some hope every morning uh, that this thing is going to be uh, well, maybe not as uh, long as we we think it's going to be. Yeah, I, I want to say this. There are certain episodes where you you put three people together and you're like, okay, like I, I I can see what this is. What this is. I feel like this episode was so well curated by us, mm-hmm. so well booked. Yeah. I'm just really happy with it. Well, we have to thank uh, our phone for that for seeing this through no. and doing the booking. Yeah. <laughs> That's anyway, what this is. Yeah. I'm I'm going to leave that <laughs> to to that. But before we get into anything, I do want to say you can always uh, if you want to support us, yeah. go to patreon.com slash it's the real. There's a difference between those who just listen and those who want to be a part of this thing as we move this forward. I think that one thing we're very, very good at is adapting, is uh, understanding the landscape and seeing that we're not just going to be put in one corner. What we do is we have our, our voice that has remained the same for the last 13 years or so. And uh, what we have done now with Quarantine Radio is really cool i think what we have planned for the future is really cool and if you guys want to be a part of that the best way to do that is to contribute to this monthly fund whether that's two dollars three dollars five dollars ten dollars at ten dollars we're gonna send you a t-shirt shout out to that um and by the way we have some really really cool t-shirts on the way yeah um we have dedicated zooms for you guys we have other incentives for you to be a part of what we're doing right now and the only place to do that is patreon.com slash it's the real and uh, we appreciate everybody who has been a part of this for the long run and we appreciate everybody who is signing up this week and moving forward uh all that to say thank you thank you to everybody who has uh really brought light to our life by showing us that we're not in this alone yes and i want to shout out somebody who signed up in the last 24 hours all right i want to shout out jack hamilton from adelaide australia Salute to you, Jack Hamilton. Yeah, also wrote a great note to us on uh, on Patreon, as many people do, and uh, we appreciate. was you. happy to talk to him yesterday. Thank you sincerely, Jack. And now, Jeff, let's get on the phone with the great Larry Wilmore. Hey, Larry! What up? Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Thank yeah, all things considered, you're doing all right day by day, moment by moment? Minute by minute, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Larry, if you think back to your time with The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, uh, could you imagine 
how much of his hair John would be pulling out these days? Oh, absolutely. This is crazy, crazy times. There's never been anything like this. You know, with all these uh, TV shows now recording from people's homes, when you were recording The Nightly Show, what would you have done if you were to do that like now? Would you, where, do, you have, do you have a room that you could have done this in? Well, that's a good question. I mean, everybody's kind of doing it differently, I guess. I mean, you just have to do it from home, but I guess it's what angle you're going to take because, you know... It's just what are you going to talk about? Are you going to try to lift people up? Are you going to try to like bring people down? down? <laughs> yeah, double double down on the sad. It's like, hey, motherfuckers, we not only got this, now we got murder hornets. So good luck to everybody, you, know? <laughs> you know, I mean, what are you going to do? Right? I'm not sure if you just saw this, but it it appears that the Trump administration is going to uh, wind down their uh, task force. And um, does that mean that Jared, uh, he accomplished everything? I think so. I think mission accomplished. Good. So shout out to Jared. Well, Jared, Jared's got to go finish the, uh, uh, the Middle East peace process. The, <laughs> the uh, peace process in the Middle East. He's got to finish that. So. He is. Uh, if, if you think of your top uh, most hated people in this administration, is Jared right up there with, with Trump? You know, for me, I don't have the same Jared hate that i guess everybody has because um he's just insignificant to me i i i like to focus mine towards trump himself mm -hmm. i like to laser beam it <laughs> you know some people you know if you look at it as like a, a backyard sprinkler some people like to have that wide muzzle you know for me i like to turn it to just laser beam and just point it right at trump like a fire hose yeah exactly because I mean, that motherfucker is just crazy, you guys. He's crazy. Like, here's the thing. But if Trump wasn't president, you wouldn't be that mad at Jared and Ivanka. You actually wouldn't, you know. It's it's Trump that has, you know, affected the way we think about everybody in his orbit. Yeah, I have I have a huge problem with Trump, clearly. But I, I do have a real problem with everybody who has uh, enabled him, you know, uh, whether that's McConnell or... Uh, whether it's anybody on his staff directly or or whether it's the people who go out and protest in front of state capitals and do Trump's bidding. It's just all this like evil cycle that just will not end. Well, those people, I don't think those people are doing Trump's bidding. They're doing their own. It's just that he he goads that type of thing, you know, and because I don't even think Trump has any ideology except for Trumpism. But if he thinks that can help him get to get back in the presidency, he's gonna fan that flame, you know. Mm. And uh but those people, they're out on their own. They're they think like that. They're they could care less whether Trump agrees or disagrees. They're gonna go out and do that shit anyway. Um Larry, when you think about uh all your years in show business and Hollywood specifically now has to probably be the weirdest time for that company town, wouldn't you say? Well, just as brothers are making their mark in the business, all I gotta <laughs> say, man. <You> know? <laughs> I mean, we're about to take some shit over. Shonda signs a big deal. Yep, yep, Kenya yep. Kenya signs a big deal. Yep. The Obamas sign a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, Obama signs a big deal. <laughs> you know, I got a little bit of crumbs. I didn't get with those motherfuckers. I got a little bit of crumbs. Then they gotta shut all this shit down. You know? I mean, it's it's surreal. Yeah. Do you have a sense of of how things will progress? I mean, let's assume that there's been a finite amount of of programs that have been shot and edited or and yeah. are are in the can now, and that goes on for the next six months or something like that. But then afterwards, what does a film set look like? What does a TV production look like? How do people you know associate with each other? in a set and uh or are you not even thinking about any of that and you're just worried about whether tyson foods is going to be shutting down their meat production yeah all of that well you know my number one concern is always going to revolve around in and out burgers yeah, so yeah. <laughs> and you know no slam to any other concerns but but guys our business is going to change fundamentally at least for the next 18 months mm -hmm. this is not like a a temporary thing 
Um, like they they already are talking about how sound stages have to be fitted with certain hand washing stations that are through a certain only a certain number of people can be in there at a certain time. How even when you enter a lot, you may have to get tested in some kind of way that will happen every day you come on that lot. You know, who knows? Will we have audiences for multicam shows? Shoot them shooting on location. Do you know how much work we do in Toronto and like Vancouver? Yeah. Some of that stuff may go away for the time being, you know. And even just doing a single camera show um, may lessen and we may go back to more of the multicam shows. It like the business may swing back to more of that model only because you can control the situation a thousand percent more when you have some simple sets and you're on a sound stage. You can just control it because here's the biggest thing, guys. Of course, um, the, the, I'll just mention two things real quick. The, all the people that work around showbiz, you know, whether it's people who work on the set, whether it's people in craft services, whether it's, you know, the, the runners or interns, whatever. Those people are hurting so bad right now because there's no way they can work. They can't work from home. They are dependent upon production. And those people are really, really, you know, just there's no way to to do anything right now until yeah. production comes back. Now, when production comes back, actors are going to be a major factor in this because they may be scared to act with another actor in a scene, you mm -hmm. know, doing – group scenes, things like that. People, there was an article today about extras may go away for a while. Why do you need extras filling in, you know, all this stuff when even Titanic 20 years ago proved you can just do that. You can put extras in with the computer. You don't really need extras. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the question. If you're going to do a multicam shoot, how are you going to fill the uh, studio audience, you know? Yeah. You're not going to have one. I know, you I know. Use <laughs> I mean, How I Met Your Mother has done that for years. It looks like a multicam, but they've never had an audience. Mm. Well, now you're just pulling the curtain back. <laughs> Let's go straight to the top on How I Met Your Mother. That's right. Uh, Larry, you you have been uh, doing a podcast for a couple of years now with The Ringer. Uh, now is the time when it seems that everyone is ordering microphones and uh, sitting down yeah, in their living room true. and uh, and understanding what this uh, this medium could be fully. How do you feel as someone who has been podcasting before this, this COVID uh, world we live in now? I don't know. I think some of the things people are doing for them will be temporary, and then the people that actually do it will stick around. You yeah. Know? But but I but I think um, yeah, because for them it's like a side gig right now, whatever you know. Um, but I think a lot of the ways we're communicating now may change a bit. Like for instance, writers' rooms. Like I'm I'm doing a couple of projects, you know, that I'm using Zoom or Ring Central, mm -hmm. Google Hangouts too. Like it's funny for all those projects, kind of using different things, but it's so easy to work that way with writers. And so when you get back to situations where like, you know, these studios are going to want to cut their budgets and they say, you know, why should we pay to rent that building for the writers when you guys can just work from home and zoom your writers room? Like that may be a change that we see in the business, you know, for a lot of different shows, shows that have the money can do it, of course, but many productions may do that as a cost saving matter, you know, yeah. let alone, if, let's say you do want to shoot in Vancouver, but why bring everybody up there when you can have a Zoom room, you know, off to the side? One right? writer who uh, worked for you at The Nightly Show is our friend Cord Jefferson. We knew him before he was a television writer. Uh, now, clearly, yeah. he is one of the top television writers that there is. I know. How how did you sort of see him when you uh, when you hired him in the first place? And, and how do you consider him now? Well, now you can't even talk to Cord. <laughs> you know? I mean, <laughs> he, was, he was already taking all the ladies from everybody. You know? now, now he's got to take all the jobs. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Cord was introduced to me by Rory um, Albanese, who's um, – he Rory worked on the, on the Daily Show, and mm -hmm. he did my show. And he found him through uh, – uh, he knew that he had worked on Gawker, I think it was. Yes, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, – and I read some of uh, Cord's pieces and just thought he was brilliant, you know. And Cord was the first person I met with for the Nightly Show when we were first talking about it. Wow. Uh, before we before we formally even hired writers. And I just, in fact, I was still, I was running Blackish at the time. We were just launching, Blackish hadn't aired yet. So I was helping Kenya launch that. And he came by the set and uh, we talked for a while, spent some time. And I thought, man, this guy was great. You know, and he was actually our first unofficial hire for the nightly show. Wow. But Cord was always just always one of the smartest guys in the room and funny at the same time. And that combination of really smart and really funny, it's just lethal for almost anything. You know, it's just 
really valuable to have. You know? And it works on a comedy like uh, like Watchmen. You That's know? right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. You know, you never know where those guys like. You know what the thing with Court is. You know, too, he's his own kind of guy too. He's his own. There's he's like a mystery thing about him. You know, you don't. You really don't know what he's thinking. About <laughs> like you don't know what he's up to. Like is he plotting like to like to rob you know me or something like that i don't know what's going on you <laughs> maybe know, <it's> <laughs> but like even if he's not i like the rumors that you're starting on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly but uh but larry how did you meet the wayans brothers Cause i imagine that that was your first job right it was one of my first ones yeah it was my first one was actually a show called late night with rick dees it was his late night show on abc and rick dees who's a was he the disc um, jockey yeah, the disc jockey. Yeah. Who, Wait, actually, Disco Duck? Yeah, no, D's, no, no, no. Rick D's Top D's, 40, yeah. No, yeah, you're right. You're right. In fact, yeah, that's he wrote the thing by a song called Disco Duck. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my fault, my fault. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but six months later, I was working on Living Color, and it was working on a Living Color where I met all the lanes. Now is one of those times where I think we're long enough into this uh, pandemic that people have sort of, sort of found their new normal. Um, so you see people, you know, start to come out of the woodwork and be funny once again. Do you have that same sense as post 9-11 where people are trying to find their footing and see what their voice is right now? I think so. It is a little tough with this because people are dying around us still. Yep. And with 9-11, it kind of happened. And there were some people that died afterwards, but it seemed so isolated to that region. It felt like, you know, there was a little separation. You could kind of get back. But, you know, and this was almost like a gradual hit to us, even though when we, you know, had to go off and isolate, you know, like I was I was dazed for a couple of weeks, yeah. I think, afterwards. I, I didn't know what to think, guys, seriously. And some of the news was so terrible and by the way and one of the things we probably cover on the nightly show on this too is how disproportionately it's affected black and minority yes, yeah, communities. yeah and, and guys that is no joke you know and it really points out just the disparity in the healthcare system and it and in infrastructure systems themselves you know like they're like we had on our show jordan carlos was one of our writers we did this thing about food deserts and how they exist in a lot of these neighborhoods where you know, people don't even have access to the same types of, of food and availabilities of products in certain neighborhoods right now, you know, yeah. let alone the ability to pay for some of these things, you know. And the the things that can happen to you as a result of that, you know, are very tough. So having said that, yes, getting back to normal definitely is a thing, but it's still weird. It's very bizarre. Like, I can... I can make jokes and then the next moment I'm like, fuck, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like back to back, you know, but, but to, but to your point, I, I definitely do feel much better than I did a month ago. You know, I think it's because I'm doing a lot of writing right now and just my, my mind is getting a little busy. So that's a good thing. So do you have projects that are now being delayed? Do you have projects that uh, are going on in a new form or, or how do you approach things now mm -hmm. with, with, you know, within your four walls? Yeah, well, I, my structure, my company to say, uh, it's called Wilmore Films. Uh, wait, why is it called that? <laughs> uh, is that, uh, is, uh, sits at NBC Universal. And so that's where I'm developing projects out of, but I still have a couple of projects that I was developing when I was at ABC Disney the last couple of years. So we have a couple of projects that are still in the works that were, are kind of in the writing stage. And, uh, you know, it's funny at NBC, I had a pilot that didn't go this year and I was real salty about it, but I never would have had a chance to shoot it. I would have been more upset over COVID fucking it than <laughs> gone down with it. You know, so who knows? But now I'm able to come, I'm working on some new ideas for uh, NBC and that, but I'm thinking about it in different terms now in the light of where we are, some of the emotions that's coming out of it. And, um, I'm also writing a movie with a couple of people that an idea that I had years ago, and I'm finishing up this documentary for Netflix that I started working on about a year or so ago with Will Smith, and it's it's on the Fourteenth Amendment. It's called Mend, and it's wow. really cool. It's like a six part docu series, and it's it's a performative docu series. So there, we have a lot of uh, guest stars and celebs in it and that kind of stuff, and I even appear in it in kind of my nightly show persona. Well, that sounds amazing. Stuff. Yeah, that's dope. And it sounds like you have a lot on your plate. <laughs> it is really dope. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm very lucky as a writer. I can still remotely do things, you know. So believe me, I know how fortunate I am because, you know, when you first get into this business, 
you know, people think, but, you know, it's a real risky business that you're in, you know, and I go, yeah, I guess, you know, yeah. and then in times like this, it's ironic that entertainment becomes one of the most stable forms of business because no people question. need an escape. But people need an escape, you know, from all this stuff. It's depressing out there. Oh, it is. Well, and are you surprised whatsoever? Look, you, you, your resume is is unmatched and it's really incredible. But there's one show oh, thanks, that I guys. think has sort of like uh, risen above the rest for a prolonged period of time, which is just <laughs> which is The Office. And are you surprised how it's hit like generation to generation? It's funny because you never know about these things. So when we first started doing The Office, like other writers in Hollywood were kind of snotty towards us. They thought it wasn't <laughs> going to be any good. And I would say, they said, what's the weird Larry, what are you working on? And I'd go, oh, I'm working on The Office. i go, oh, conversation would just stop. <laughs> oh, you know. And they want to move on. I'm like, motherfucker, what? No, it's going to be good. What's wrong with you? you know? But it was also at a time when like everybody was like adapting all these British shows and then exactly. like putting them over here and so like skins had come over and like a few others and so like everything failed except for the office yeah, yeah. There, there was couplings that had failed. oh, oh couplings yeah couplings too yeah Man. yeah and couplings didn't make sense because couplings was already an echo of friends right like, well, we already did that <laughs> why are we doing that you know it didn't make sense but uh so that was when we were doing it we and we were producing the show in a warehouse, like in L.A., and then we went out to Van Nuys. Like, you know, it felt like we were on a remote island. <laughs> so we had we had zero contact with the outside world, and people thought it wasn't going to be any good because the pilot had leaked out. And Greg, um, Greg Daniels, mm-hmm. who runs the show, um, he did the the English pilot. You know, just did, didn't change anything. Right. And it really wasn't it really wasn't suited for Steve Carell, really. You know. And so, but people judged that and thought we were just going to do all the English scripts. And so they were really mad at that too, you know? Yeah. And, and of course, the first one out of the gate is Diversity Day. So it's like, fuck you guys. Look yeah. you. <laughs> 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 but it took a while. It took a while for people to get into it. We were almost canceled after those first six episodes. And then they only picked us up for like six episodes for the second season. And while we were doing those, they gave us seven more. And then they gave us the back nine. It was like this gradual thing of us always thinking we we're going to get canceled until the end of the second season. Oh, that's, yeah, it's got to be like an emotional roller coaster. It's a lot. Of just like, yeah. you know, you're looking for other work and then you don't take the other work because this other thing comes in. And or so, you want to yeah. believe in this exactly. so much that it yeah. will continue and hope that NBC exactly. feels the same way. Yeah. And who and who would have thought this is gonna be a classic, motherfuckers? This is gonna be a classic. Yeah. You know, like nobody, we didn't think that. We were just trying to stay on. You know? Do you get recognized most off of uh, Mr. Brown, or uh, over just like just you being you over the past, you know, thirty some odd years? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's funny. I think the the nightly show kind of put me in a different category of that type of thing. Like I always said, I had a great type of fame. I call it cable fame. Like the only people who recognized me were the people that liked what I did. Yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't famous enough to suck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like people because once you get real famous, you can suck. It's like, oh yeah, I know that guy is he sucks. You know? <laughs> so so if you knew me, it meant that you liked me because you watch those shows, you know. Well, wasn't so, it that like was, there was a name attached to your face now? Because that then, then you're like Billboard famous, right? Like as opposed yeah. to oh, you're that guy from that thing, and I, I I know you, but I don't know from where. Right. So during the nightly show, I I got to the stage of being able to suck, but because <laughs> the night, but because the nightly show only lasted a year and a half, I went back to the specialty phase, which actually I kind of like better. <laughs> So, so if people have a faint of the other thing, it's almost like, uh, man, you look familiar. Were, are you? Were you at ESPN? Like they can't place it, you know? Like they think I. Just Wait, they think you're Mike like Tirico? <laughs> yes, they know it's true. They think I'm him or I'm Michael Wilbon. Oh my one god, of those guys, you know, they they can't place it. So I just say, I just say, no, no, no. And even if they think they know who I am, I always deny it. But the <laughs> nicest, the nicest people say, "Oh my God, you were Mr. Brown on The Office!" Like they go right to that, the Office fan. Like they don't even know that I did Daily Show or Nightly Show. Oh, and by the way, Daily Show is a separate category. The people that know me as Senior Black Correspondent. Sure, yeah. Like some of those people don't even know Nightly Show. Man. It's like you guys know I did another show. They go, oh, <laughs> came like, on right after it. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, it's like. And I, I have this fascination with with the generation thing with The Office because it's not only like you know our generation loves it. It's not just that yeah. you know the the kids that are watching it for the first time now on Netflix right. are are loving it, but it's also that people like Bun B, who we spoke with, finds Michael Scott to be the third greatest television character ever behind Archie Bunker and Omar from The Wire. Wow. Yeah. That's Which amazing. Pretty good company. Well, listen, Larry, uh, we appreciate you for so much. Your 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 Thanks, your entire career and also your voice now more than ever. Um, thank you for the work that you do. We're sending love to you and yours. Be safe, be inside, and be creative. And uh, and hopefully too. we'll see you on the other side of this. You too. And let me just give one last shout out. I have first responders in my family. And uh, I just want to give some love and a shout out to everybody on the front lines out there, man. Really appreciate what you're doing. It's so important. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay. Take care, guys. Thanks. And now, Jeff, let's call out to Brooklyn and get on the phone with Sylvia Obel. Sylvia! What up? Ba, 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 ba. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing all right. Yeah. How are you surviving during these very Weird turbulent times? times? Yeah. Um, you know, just a lot of prayer, mm-hmm. a lot of meditation, mm-hmm. um, a lot of self care that doesn't involve leaving the house. Good, yeah. And just trying not to focus on the big existential crisis of there we what go. The fuck does my life look like? <laughs> That's <after>? exactly right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just looming over my head. Yeah, I've I've very much been trying to focus on what I can control and being like in the moment and uh, not thinking about like you said months down the line or years down the line or or what any of this really is. So, shout out to all of us. Yeah. Let's, yeah, starting this off with like a real positive note, guys. <laughs> Questioning our existence. Great. Um, Sylvia, first of all, congratulations on your new podcast. Thank you so much. This was uh, something I'm sure not spur the moment. It was long in the works, but um, it this seems yes. like the perfect time for people to uh, be at home and have their ears ready to listen. Yeah, I mean, it definitely worked out in that favor. Um Netflix via Jasmine Lawson reached out to me like first dropped this idea in my ear almost a whole year ago at this wow. point and we definitely you know first she came to me and asked me what I would think of it and I definitely got excited right away um, a few months later towards the end of the summer she definitely asked me how I felt about like Scotty being my co-host and I was like are you kidding that's one of my that's my girl yeah, like, yeah. absolutely <laughs> How do you and feel then, about her? You guys are friends. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like, right. I was like, no, we're friends for real. Like, I would be thrilled. And then um, in October, we probably is when we had our first meeting at Pineapple Street uh, Media, where the who are the production team for the podcast. Um, and we've been developing it since November, December into January and actually had our meet, our final, like, meeting like a week before everything shut down as far as like contract signing wow so like we really didn't even anticipate the quarantine like we didn't we weren't able to do our promotional shoot or a lot of the things that we had planned for the launch but we didn't want to hold it back because we felt like now was the perfect time for people to be hungry for this sort of content to listen to and just to hear friends interacting that's a big feedback we've gotten because a lot of people are missing their friends absolutely listening to friends is comforting to them how did you uh first get wind of the fact that instead of videoing you guys because that wasn't possible you weren't going to be together in a studio uh that they would do animation instead yeah well so like in our in our final meeting what we didn't know would be our final meeting it's like <laughs> the last supper that we didn't know um we talked about different ways we wanted to promote the audio socially because you guys know you guys have a podcast yes it's harder to do social promo for podcasts you have to get creative you're like what can we do so we talked about different options about like having like a zoom camera in the studio but animation and illustration is definitely something that had come up and then you know because we thought it would be like a really creative new way to do especially if you have the budget shout out to netflix (laughs) so we were like yeah that definitely is an option and when the quarantine hit and it became apparent to us that we didn't want to, like obviously we weren't going to risk our lives to make this podcast as much as we wanted to we decided that animation was the best way to go about it and it just really hit home like i was already i think a lot of us were leaning towards the cartoons 
prior to this anyway, but I think we were definitely going to have, like, an actual photo shoot for, like, the podcast cover and right. some launch stuff. But thank goodness we had been also looking for black animators and illustrators for the cartoon because we had one already. You know, we had a few that we were looking at before this hit, and we were able to lean into Daryl, who is the animator for this. Well, that's super awesome. Uh, you have been an on-air presence for a long time now. We know who you are. We know what your, your presence is like in the human form. Was it weird to see yourself as a, you know, walking, talking cartoon? So, so <laughs> weird. <laughs> I think it's a weird experience for a lot of people who know. I mean, I think one of our, like, literally David Dennis on Twitter just told me that watching it felt like an acid trip to him. And I thought that was the first... <laughs> That was the first feedback of that sort that we had gotten, but it's definitely, you definitely have to like, there's like a marriage of like what you think you look like and then creative license. Like I know <laughs> Scotty definitely was like, I feel like my, you know, my hair could use a little conditioner. <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel like my bangs are a little longer. You know, does my nose look like that? I don't know. <laughs> but it, it's, but we really feel like it captured the essence of like yes. our spirit. Yes. And like, I do think that, it's really cool. Like, it's really cool. So many people are asking for a cartoon version. They're like, can we just have an animated version of this podcast? And I was like, I can't even, I, I would love, like, if a dark swim, car, adult swim cartoon came out of this, but That'd be it'd fire. be really cool. It'd be, it'd be really cool, especially, especially with our audio. Yeah, well, cool. Sylvia, I want to ask, you know, uh, what is something that you have been watching during quarantine? You know, like, what is your comfort food during all of this? You know, it's been an interesting array because I really burned through my initial. <laughs> like, I feel like because we're like sixty days, I'm I'm like sixty days in at this point. Um, yeah. I'm currently randomly watching something that I think will surprise a lot of people, but it is a very popular wh- uh, white show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm known for like my love of like black shit, and I really do love most black shit. But I've been really watching Mad Men recently. Like, oh, yo, watching Mad it's Men. so good. That is <laughs> also so white. That is a great white show. But like it's so great and white, and it's such a weird <laughs> thing for me to say that in a sense. Those two words in a sense together, but it's so. I think it's a. It's comforting because it's like it reminds me of a time way before any of these things were our problems. But also like my personal life watching this prior to being like in this crisis, and yeah. I think it's just such good content. I think like sometimes it's like easy to rewatch good shows like that, and um, I feel the same way about. Um, some of the like I've been watching a lot of Grey's Anatomy and mm. I've like you know I've been watching a lot of um a different world and like shows that like I've lo- I've been watching my favorite things and I can tell it's like a comfort coping mechanism like security blanket kind of thing yeah, yeah for do, sure do you get the sense when you watch that you're just like I understand this was taped years ago but I'm still so concerned that they're working in an office not six feet from the, from another person, and I'm, I'm concerned that that person is touching their face, and I'm concerned that that person's not wearing a mask. Oh, my God, absolutely. And I think I'm even more triggered by that when I watch new stuff. Like, I've been watching some new things on Netflix, like um, the Never Have I Ever show, which is so good, and um, some uh, I watched Black as Fuck because I had to see what the hype was about. But, yeah. like, so many... Um, so many of those shows of current times because it's kind of triggering because it was like just last year that people take this and I'm already thinking about how differently we're moving like just how yeah like just touching things and not washing their hands and sitting next to each other and like wait nobody's watching people not wash their hands on on Netflix on Netflix (laughs) (laughs) I want to be clear like in no world was anybody like watching people wash their hands and then that's the show I feel like washing hands is gonna become like the wearing condoms debacle you know what I mean oh yeah remember when Insecure when everybody was like Issa wear the condoms she was like nigga wearing condoms and now it's kind of like why aren't they washing their hands Sylvia do you do you make it outside regularly like do you go to the grocery store like when there are other people around not at all you guys i've been playing this thing so safe i do think i'm one of like the surprisingly rare people who literally has not like i do not leave my house yeah or my apartment mainly because i live in new york city i live in brooklyn yeah the epicenter and i have no car yeah so the only way to get like i understand my friends who live in the suburbs who could take their car somewhere to go get food and this and that but that's not really our reality here and i don't live walking distance from a grocery store so i've been really heavily dependent on delivery services to get everything the furthest i've gone is my bodega 
on the corner, literal corner of my block, like twice. So how does it work when someone comes over to deliver something? Is there like, you have to work something out where they like leave it on your step and then you sort of like go out and put the money down and then walk back in? Or how, how does the dance work? <laughs> Um, yeah, so this, I mean, I think the apps have, delivery apps have really adapted to this problem quickly. But they have a lot of drop-off options where you can kind of put your instructions for what a safe drop-off looks like. Not, no contact drop-off looks like for you. Like, even a lot of the apps like that have been around, like Uber Eats, Postmates, and, like, those type of things and have done, like, a there's a no-contact delivery option now. And I think, but I, I mean, for the grocery stuff, like, I've been using you know, like whether it's Fresh Direct or Freshly or like Amazon Fresh, like mm-hmm. those come in the mail. So they basically just buzz my apartment and I, and then they leave the box downstairs in the lobby. Luckily, I have a buzzer. So, and like, also, luckily, you trust your neighbors. So that's also a good thing. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, yeah, that's true. But I think that's also the benefit of my situation. I live in a small brownstone, like a brownstone where there's only oh, two units. Oh, excuse me. So hey, now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm always like smaller buildings because neighbors are very uncontrollable in New York City. So I'm always the person looking for like a brownstone with three apartments in it than like a building. With right. So many people yeah. Surrounding. Right. Um, Play so, the odds. Yeah, look, yeah. So, yeah. So there's. There's not many of us. There's only like four people in this building currently because a lot of people fled. And yeah. I'm, uh, I don't blame them. <laughs> well, actually, like <laughs> being in your apartment all day is not what anybody really signed up for when they moved to New York. So, like, right. because the, the you know, your neighbors are home as well. And so, like, what's the most annoying or great thing that your neighbor has done during all this because like one of our neighbors put up a note as soon as this thing hit and she was like, I work at Trader Joe's. And if anybody needs anything from Trader Joe's, like, I got you. You don't have to go to the grocery store. Right. And wow. con- conversely, conversely, there's we, a person upstairs. Oh, well, I mean, like, there's a bunch of people. Or I a guess. family or something. I don't, know, I don't know who lives upstairs. But they have been doing jumping jacks for, like, an <laughs> hour straight. And that's not what we signed up for. Yeah, we didn't sign up for jumping jacks hour. So my question <laughs> is, uh, what is something your neighbors have either done that's great or not great? Um... The not great thing, and I do feel terrible complaining because I do feel like I've heard so many crazy horror stories, and thank God there's no kids in my building. <laughs> um, but I, the most annoying thing is, oh, it's okay, so look at me, I'm whispering. Like, I know, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I feel like one of my, the people upstairs, one of the girls who lives upstairs has the most annoying voice. Oh, no. And it's something that you don't really realize until you're stuck, right? So, like, a lot of mornings I'm awoken up to the sound, um, like a conference call or whatever it may be, of, like, this Pee Wee Herman-esque, Yo. <laughs> like, Yo. Yeah, 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 <laughs> like, type situation. And I'm just like, God, why? Yo. Why? <laughs> Sylvia keeps looking at, like, CNN's, like, you know, how many more months we have to go through this. And she was like, fuck, like, just not, not, not this voice. And ends that you have to be woken up to it. That's even worse. Yeah. And it's like, it's like usually, and thankfully it's not like super early in the morning. I'm definitely like in, in media. So like I'm waking up at like 9, 10 a.m. But yeah. like it's, it is, it's been, that's a more recent thing of this week, but it's definitely always been annoying when you just hear it. But we're just all in the house now more, right? So we're, I think we're noticing things about our neighbors that like we hadn't noticed prior. And definitely like the sound of their voices is one of them. For yeah, me. for sure. Um, I think the good thing that has been is that everybody's kind of just been keeping it down. Like, you know, aside from the occasional screech or like scream or laughter. Or Pee Wee um, Herman upstairs. <laughs> yes. You know, aside from that, it's been pretty copacetic and I appreciate the ability to have a good vibe and energy because I think it's so important especially as we as creatives try to like create in this environment that's very stifled naturally well let me ask you this then do you feel creative now because we've spoken to a lot of people and there's a wide range some people are like this is my time I'm gonna double down I feel inspired I can focus and then there's people who are like yo I feel like the the, the greater world crushing down on me. I don't. Yeah, the walls I don't, are closing in. I don't know you how know, to feel. Cameron is doing double dutch. <laughs> yeah. You know, in his, everything, uh, in his apartment. Everything is going. Everything is. Yeah. Uh, that was up is now down. You know. So yeah. So uh, how are you on the on the scale of one to creative? I think you know. I think it's what's crazy is that we've now I think been in this long enough where I feel like I've experienced a transition mm. because it's like in the beginning, like March and half of April were really just dead to me like i was not on the wave of people who were suddenly broadcasting on ig live daily or like <laughs> pivoting to like you know 
radio. Like you guys, like you, I think it's amazing how you guys pivoted to daily radio shows and like all of that type of stuff. Or like, you know what? I'm gonna write that book. Right. Finally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like right. no, I like I was in a really like I was exhausted. I don't think I realized how exhausted I was, so I had to be still and stop running from my exhaustion. And I think it's easy, especially in New York, in the hustle and bustle to not realize how tired you are if you keep moving. But when I was forced to stop moving and be still, it just all caught up with me. And for the first month, I really just wanted to embrace the moment, the rare opportunity to be still and like just kind of hear from God and like journal and meditate and think about like what to think about all the things I had been avoiding thinking about because I was too busy especially because I just felt so my anxiety had kind of drained my creativeness in that moment because I think I was just adjusting to the shell shock of like what was happening around us. Absolutely. And also panicking because like, especially in the beginning, every cough, every sneeze, I thought I was dying. Oh my God. It was just really, and I'm asthmatic, which is one of the reasons why I've definitely taken this like twice as serious. Very serious. I I already have a respiratory illness so like for a respiratory disease to be on the loose that's like the worst case scenario for me and i really had to like cope with all of that um so initially i did not feel any batch of creativeness at all i was like wow good for the people who are but i wasn't even on i even took a break from social media in a lot of ways where i wasn't posting like i used to or anything like that um and now but then i think i'm thankful that for me, I think I'm thankful that we already had this podcast undergoing yep. because I think once we started like the first episode and like, you know, launching it in that way, I really felt like the juices come back and like, really. and at that time we had been home for like 45 days or so. We just launched the podcast on April 30th and I finally felt like I, because I had been still and rested and taking that break that I had like a renewed sense of energy to like do this thing. Now, I don't know if I would have had the energy to create something from scratch you know what i mean yeah, I think for me, yeah i was thankful that i had something in the works and now i can put my energy there for sure that's kind of in my story but my dad definitely was like <laughs> my dad checks in like once a month from um nairobi because yes. he's in kenya yeah and wow. much sa- consequently much safer than the rest of us yeah and um he was like yeah i think now's that time that you should write a book and I'm like, Dad, I just literally launched a Netflix show. Be grateful. <laughs> and, <laughs> now is not the relax. time. <laughs> I don't know if you heard. Relax. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm trying to get some sleep and Pee Wee upstairs is just pissing me off. Uh, when you talk about exhaustion, Sylvia, um, do the normal things or things in a pre-COVID world normal, do those things start to be like, yo, this is a sort of uh, – you know, this is a, a a burden almost, you know, where it's like, you know, your family wants to check in on you. You have regular Zooms. We have a regular Zoom with our family. We FaceTime with our family. Like we, we keep up with friends, obviously, and we're doing work. Does that end up feeling like a job itself? Um. Yeah, I, I think it definitely can. I think one of the things I'm really grateful for is that I started to practice boundaries prior to this. Mm. It's not an easy thing, especially for me. I'm a natural people pleaser. I want to make everybody around me happy. And I think for me, it's definitely hard to put my needs first. But especially that first month, I was so... I was so, like, out that I needed to, like, I had to put even, like, please don't ask me how I'm feel like, how I'm doing. The how yeah. are you feeling question was so stressful in itself. I didn't mind checking in, like, yes, please make sure I'm alive. I'm definitely <laughs> the center. And, like, you know, hit me up. But I think for me, like, I did not, like, asking me to explain my feelings during this felt extremely burdensome at first because I was like, I need time to pro- process this. I didn't know I was going to live through a plague. Yeah, like, right. You know, like, I didn't know, like, that was going to be a thing. Um, and I definitely think I'm thankful for friends. We had this conversation on the podcast about how this is a good time to know who your friends are and give them grace because I was not up for the zoom brunches. I was not up for the zoom calls and like having to get on camera because I was finally glad to not have to look cute for none of my body <laughs> and like to just look like, un- like nobody can see me for a while. I was right. ready to have that moment. So, um, those definitely felt burdensome at first to me. I mean, my mother, nobody checks in on me more than her. God bless her, and mm-hmm. I'm so thankful for that. But, you know, it definitely increased with the paranoia of, like, I can't imagine how stressful it is to go through this with a child yeah. who's not around you that you cannot protect. Yeah, You yeah. know what I mean? And so, like, I get that I'm that for her because my sister's at home. 
because she's it was her senior year of college mm-hmm. this year so mm-hmm. she's in the house i'm the only one of her kids who is not under her eyesight right now yeah so you know the check-ins were definitely coming in but i definitely understand i have to like come on i understood because i get that it's a scary time to not know if i'm okay or not so. yeah and your sister i'm sorry your sister is graduating college but not having that graduation time huh? yeah it's, oh man yeah, so my sister my sister's next week next thursday was supposed to be her walk across undergraduate bachelor degree Man. um graduation and i am devastated that honestly when this all hit and it became real like how long it was going to be that was the first my first concern like it wasn't even for myself it was just like my sister has worked her ass off for four years to graduate and now she won't get to walk yeah you know what i mean and then like my i had even like my grow my grandmother, we had gotten her a ticket to fly out from Nairobi oh. to here. We haven't seen her in four years. She usually comes out based on graduation. You know, African parents, like, those are the milestones. Right, right, so right. She yeah. usually, cause she usually, she, you know, like, schedules her visits around her grandkids' graduations. And so we, she was supposed to be here this week, actually. So we were, you know, we could spend Mother's Day with her. Yeah. And my mom could have her mom here on Mother's Day. And there were just, like, all these family things that we had planned for years that are now not happening. And thankfully my sister, she goes to the University of Arts in Philadelphia, mm. um, is still gonna be able to graduate. And thankfully her specific school said that when this is when they are able, they will have a ceremony for them. Oh, that's great, the yeah. Year. Like they're definitely gonna not rob them of that. Um, but I'm very thankful for like the virtual commencements that are being yeah. planned because I really, it's, it's a gap. And I, I couldn't imagine if it was me, I'd be pissed. I'd be livid. <laughs> I but so on the plus side, now she gets Barack Obama to to do her commencement speech. There you go. It's so yeah. true. And I mean, and here's the funny thing: Michelle Obama was my graduation speaker, and I really thought nobody was, she was never going to be able to beat that. And now <laughs> he's like, <laughs> like yeah, somehow we went around big. I was like, wow. We both had Obama as graduation speakers. <laughs> How many siblings can say that? I that's fucking know. dope. That is fantastic. That's like that's the best brag I've heard in so long. You want to hear a horrible thing, Sylvia? My graduation uh, commencement speaker, Rudy Giuliani. <gasps> yeah, I, know, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Did not age well. <laughs> no. But also, most of your graduating class turned their backs on That him. is true. So that was, Ooh, that was great. Protest. Okay. Do you have anything planned for Mother's Day? This is a very atypical holiday uh, this time around. How are you choosing to celebrate with your mother? Yeah, it is. You know, I think I'm definitely going to send flowers and I'm sending, you know, some money because I don't feel like it, I couldn't really go to a store or get anything. And I also feel like now is the right, like specifically now, money is more needed than gifts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I think like, you know, it, this stuff has really hit people in a real way. I'm currently the only one in my immediate family who's able to work still right now. Man, you wow. know what I mean? Like I... Like, my sister obviously is graduating from college. Yeah. But her side job, like, she's a photographer. So her, that's how she used to make her money for rent and stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? Was to, to at events. And now there's no events. Yeah. So, all, you know, that's messing, you know, her up there. And then my mom um, worked at a store. So that store is closed, obviously. And um, thankfully, my stepfather is retired. So, like, there's, you know, retirement money there. But, like, for the most part, when you talk about, like, active working, like, you know what I mean? Like. I feel kind of responsible in a lot of ways because I feel like there's only one of us who are still having that come in. So it's really, and I think that's a reality for a lot of black young professionals who are finding ourselves in that position that we didn't expect, you know, because um, we don't really tend to have that privilege of generational wealth. That's not a thing for us. So with so many people living paycheck to paycheck for those paychecks to stop, and especially if you weren't necessarily fired so you can't really go on unemployment you know what i mean yeah things just kind of closed it's it's really hard yeah well i think that we're uh thankful on so many levels that uh your voice is amplified by a place like netflix i think it's so important i think now is the time we are so looking forward to each and every episode with you and diani congratulations sylvia um thank you be safe out there or in there in there stay strong stay indoors Uh, and also i mean like you know once we're out of this i hope that we actually get to hang out more we we, it's such a rare occurrence that we get to be in the same place at the same time and so like but but you always bring such like a brightness to our days and so uh, we'll look we'll look forward to that in the meantime be well and we'll be checking in all right 
Okay, guys. Thank you so much. Bye. And now, Jeff, let's call out to Los Angeles, California, and get Kev on stage on the phone. Hello? Kev! What up? What up? What's happening? How are you? I'm good, man. How are you guys? We're doing all right. Hanging in there. Nice. Good to hear. Yeah, man. Uh, So listen, Kev, this is uh, a very different time. This is not... uh, you know, anything that we're used to, how has, how have things gone by day by day for you? Um, day by day, you know, that's changed. I think there was the first, wait, are we live already? Yeah. <laughs> Man, that was quick. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, we could do another intro. <laughs> no, 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 day by day, this, this is cool. I'm like, Man, this is, we, we serious about it. <laughs> I feel like day by day has changed. I feel like the first two weeks, maybe three weeks, it was like, oh, yeah, this is like a weird aberration. You know what I'm saying? It'll be cool. And then, you know, I'm going to eat whatever I want and get back to normal in like a week or two. And then two weeks became four weeks and four weeks became six weeks. And then it was like. Then six weeks became six years. And it's just like, and we're yeah. still here. <laughs> yeah. <All right>. uh, <laughs> so, um, I think probably about two or three weeks ago, I was like, man, this isn't anything normal. I'm going to have to get used to this being what it is for right now and also prepare for the world to look different for the foreseeable future. Not necessarily. That's I think when we say that, we assume that means very bad. Mm. Right. But anytime there's a event, an, even a natural disaster that's big, a global event, attack, a war, the world looks different for a while after that. And in some ways, some things never return the way we used to. I was actually talking to my brother about this this morning. And I was like, bro, people used to be riding horses. <laughs> and, like, and if you owned a lot of horses, you were the man. Like, bro, you know that dude got 112 horses? Bro, we, he could kill us. You know, then the car came around. People were like, bro, horses are dumb now. You know what I mean? like, so if you made horse shoes, you could have been the man five years ago, and you're now useless. So you better learn how to do something else with that skill. And I feel like that's what the world is like. Uh, Kev, I'm just getting. curious, and I'm, I'm really hoping – that this is not the case, but is your brother in the business of selling horses? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank God, because you're, you're you're just destroying that whole you know market right there. Yeah, you're just like, well, <laughs> listen. I mean, but horses are still around. They're just not as valuable as they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kev, what gives you hope when you wake up each morning right now? You know what's crazy, bro? I just had a shot a podcast with a with a therapist. And I was like, part of my success is the fear of failure. And I worked so hard to, like, prevent myself to fail. And this happened. I was like, you know, there was no world where I thought I would not be doing stand-up comedy. I thought, if anything, that would be the only thing I could do is yeah. stand-up. Yeah. And that was taken away. And he was like, he was a fan of mine before. And it was a, a he said, you know, Kev, your whole career has been built on you figuring out how to do something with what you're giving what makes you think that you won't figure it out, whatever the world looks like? And I was like, man, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Why not? Man? Yeah. I could do this, man. I'm the man, man. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So, But, Kev, I don't uh, want to, I don't want to, you know, take any air out of how good you feel talking to that guy. But he was a fan. <laughs> he was a fan. He, he wants to fan, see you continue. Yeah. This is yeah. true. Yeah. But he was licensed. So he had a <laughs> To, to, to back up his claim, you know, so that's what definitely gives me hope is that, like, you know, whatever the world looks like, you know, I have my health, I got my family, I got my creative ability, and I'll find out, I'll find a way to do what I've done. Because I, in, in, in some ways, nothing I've done is traditional. Like, I didn't come to Hollywood and do the auditions and get an Asian. Like, so in some ways, this is just another example of, like, having to figure it out, you know, one way or another. So I, I kind of welcome the challenge now. Yeah, I mean, well, how did you even get into the industry? I mean, like, I know that you you grew up in a military family and you moved around a lot, but like, how did you first like start to feel like you had like you had momentum? Honestly, I can't even say that I've ever had that feeling. I <laughs> looking at myself. Wait I never one sec. We're gonna like... we're gonna patch in the therapist. <laughs> 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 Just hold I on. I really one. never have, and I think that might be why I've had successes. I've never felt like. Oh, this is actually going well. You know what I mean? Like, I work like it'll all be taken away tomorrow. And I think that's why I've kind of achieved, you know, what I've achieved. And I'm, I guess in some other ways, I'm always looking to the next challenge. So I never rest on my current 
success that other people be like, bro, you, you killing it. Like I never have the, you're killing it thought. It's just, you know, what I want to do next and, and, and striving for that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of how I think about things. So when, so you've had this whole career where you're like, yo, I'm expecting the other shoe to drop and then a worldwide pandemic hits and you're like, see, See, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. It was actually to make that worse. It was my wife being able to say, "I told you so." You, know, like, you never know what could happen, girl. I'm like, girl, what could happen to where I can't do stand up? And then this happened. I was like, okay, so actually, that could happen well, to where I can't do stand up. So you know, but luckily, you prepare for. As artists, you guys know, we always are. You know, especially in cancel culture, I'm like, man, I'm gonna say something on accident and get canceled. So. I've always been living in fear of that. So luckily I didn't get canceled, but the whole world got canceled. So I wasn't completely wrong, but you know, <laughs> I wasn't completely right either. Well, Kev, was there a moment when you were growing up when you felt that you had a voice and you knew the path in which you could you could uh, you sure. share that? Yeah. Um, I, I feel like, you know, as a kid, interestingly enough, I, I always thought I'd be great. I always thought I would travel. Um, I just thought I'd be playing basketball in the NBA. Mm. I was way off as far as that. <laughs> uh, but I did turn out to be able to travel for work and, uh, you know, do what I love. But I, I don't know. I just I never thought uh, I guess I could have never imagined this because this was unimaginable. Like you were a stand up comedian. You made movies and then you became a movie star. The path that I've taken hadn't been nobody had done that yet. You know what I'm saying? Like YouTube was a not a professional thing. It was just a place to watch cat videos. <laughs> and then people started making living out of it. You know what I'm saying? But hardly anybody has, there hasn't been an Eddie Murphy to, from, from YouTube to the movie stars yet. Right. Where, like, this, Wait, what about Jake thing. Paul? <laughs> Jake Cole? No. Jake, yeah. What about Jake? <laughs> no, Jake Paul. <laughs> oh, Jake. <laughs> Yo, by the way, imagine Jeff just had this other idea of who J. Cole really was. Yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah. I, th I think that J. Cole is the Eddie Murphy of our generation. <laughs> Very well known for his comedy. <laughs> but, uh, so the, you know, it's funny. Logan Paul's manager used to manage my sons when we first moved to L.A. Believe that or not. I, I, yeah, I'm, kind of I'm going to choose to believe that, but explain this to me. <laughs> yeah, I have so many questions. So, my the person that my when we moved to LA, uh, one of the talent bookers or scouts, I guess, for Austin CV had found my son and brought him to Brian Robbins, and he was their first manager. He helped guide him to get the uh, my son did a remake of Little Rascals, and then the dude left Austinness and he went to work for uh, uh, the Collective or Collab, something like that. Collab, I think he was a talent manager, and he was assigned like Logan Paul because Logan Paul had signed with them. And then he just became his manager. And then, like, Logan Paul blew up. And that's literally the only client he's had to have for a wow. long time. Wow. So, and he even, like, over the years, he even still sent my son roles and stuff. But, like, we realized kind of really early that Hollywood for your kids, you ha that has to be your life in order for you to even, them to even have a chance to make it. And my kids were not trying to do that. They yeah. were like, bro, I'm not trying to do all this audition, <laughs> bro. Just, like. I just want to go to school and come home. And I was like, all right, well, bet. It was, <laughs> it's like, it's too hard to do that if that's not your whole thing. You know what I'm saying? And then even if you succeed, the chance of your kid being like a freaking whack job yeah. is so high. It's like, is it even really worth risking their livelihood off of, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, uh, it just was too much of a risk. Yeah. So I, I, I was cool off that. They were cool off it. If they ever want to come back to it, they'll always have the chance. But they were regular kids. Kev, you're somebody who has traveled, like you said, quite a bunch. Um, you were consistently on the road. How does it feel to be in one place for a prolonged period of time? You know what's crazy? I was talking to Doughboy about this, my, my friend. Yeah. He was saying the one thing you complained about, like the one negative part of being Kev on stage um, is, and I only use third person to, you know, to connect. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. A jerk. Right. Uh, was it takes it, it? It was taking me away from my family a lot. So I've actually really enjoyed being able to go and bother my children at record amounts of time <laughs> over this last two months. I actually just asked my youngest son. He was in the kitchen. I was like, "Hey, man, have, how do you like me being home more, even though I bother you more?" He was like, "Oh, it's the best. Like, yeah, I will take you bothering me versus you not being 
Oh, it's a great answer. So, Wait, put him on I the phone. Do- <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear his since response. I, <laughs> which I love and miss. Like I love that. I love doing stand up. Like I have really taken advantage of being home. We've watched so many movies. It, it's been that part has been great. You yeah, know what I'm saying? I mean, so, it, I feel like it must be like this very you know unexpected reward from this whole thing, which is that like a lot of families are getting closer together. I wonder how are you as a uh as a teacher because all these kids have to be like taught by you now no they don't (laughs) i don't do understood yeah with their school thank the lord their mom (laughs) does it like i'm trash i bring very little to the table besides humor and income uh my wife my wife does and that's not even a thing i'm proud of it's just she just does it and i'm like ah it's a whole thing. She's already kind of talking. Wait, so you, it. yeah, it's like, you, you know, punch in at like three 30. <laughs> yes. I'm like, Oh, my wife's cooking dinner. Hey, come crack a couple jokes. Or two. You guys want to watch a movie? You know, I bring the snacks. Like I bring a totally different, I'm a good locker room guy. Yeah. You know how to my work wife, that remote very, very well. I could, yeah. Yes. I'm a, I'm a rah, rah, rah. I'll clap <laughs> it up for you. When you dunk on somebody, but you don't want, you don't want the ball in my hands <laughs> with the home school. Um, have you been staying inside uh, most of the day? Do you like get outside? Do you get fresh air? What's your yard situation like? Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually, when I wake up, the first thing I do is walk in my neighborhood for an hour and a half to get exercise. Uh, I do some work, clear my mind, have some alone time. Um, and then I stay in the house for the rest of the day. Oh, well, you know who else gets some, uh, some fresh air in the mornings is our mutual friend, Josh Gonzalez. Uh, Josh, oh, my boy, Josh though, uh, seems to aimlessly walk just on Instagram live. Yeah. I accuse yes. him of walking to the beach, but he keeps telling me that he lives 20 miles away from the beach, which is way too far to walk <laughs> to the beach. <laughs> we just want to make sure our friends are safe, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad. Josh has actually lost weight during the pandemic, which is an amazing feat. He Shout actually out to him. on this. So good on him. Yes. Yeah, because he keeps walking 20 miles to the beach. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Kev, you have a uh, a very dedicated and loyal fan base. You are, uh, you know, out there on the road for, for so many of these days. There's a connection that you can have from that stage to meeting them afterwards to, to having, you know, this human to human connection. How do you maintain that now when you are, besides going out for an hour and a half walk every morning, stuck in your home? Yeah. Do you do any meet and greets on that uh, mile and a half walk? <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> you guys are funny, man. I'm having a good time. Uh, I do two things. One, um, I've been doing cameos. Um, I had done them for a while, but I kind of, with the, all the travel, it was just impossible to keep up with the influx of them. So Cameo is the personalized uh, uh, yeah, video like, message you can send a person. Yeah, Actually, what's yeah. the best cameo that you've had to do for someone? Uh, man, I... <laughs> all, they're almost all happy birthday, happy Mother's Day, happy anniversary. One. Yeah. But the, the ones that are, are great, um, this person had a creative one today, birthday message, which was, uh, tell, tell, tell my, my wife that I would have come to you, you know, I, you had hired me to come to your birthday, but because of Corona, I couldn't make it, you know, but otherwise, this is, <laughs> this is, this is, this yeah, that was the here. one thing <laughs> it yeah. took a pandemic to stop it. That's right. Yeah. It, if it weren't for Corona, Kev was pulling up to your actual <laughs> birthday party. So that was great. And, uh, on our Patreon, we actually go live on our Patreon before we shoot during our live shoot. So we end up and, and we do some lives on Patreon that aren't, uh, available to the public so that's probably another good thing being able to chop it up with my patreons which is kind of like the fans that sacrifice the most they actually pay monthly to support um so i've definitely been making sure that they've been squared away then i've just been going live more than i usually do Mm -hmm. i have more time at home there's a i've been going live on my youtube and fans can call in and i talk to them that's awesome for like an hour and a half and that's a free version of uh, just a free way to connect with my fans. So I kind of try to mix it up. I don't want everything to be for Patreon. I don't want everything to always be for pay. You know yeah, what I'm right. Saying? Like, there's definitely a value in just connecting with the people who support you, even if they don't have to pay for it to 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 access you. 
Kev, creatively, have you been able to imagine beyond the, the walls of your house and 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 beyond the current news uh, cycle that is out there? Because I'm sure it's easy to, with no pop culture, with no sports, with nothing going on, to just, you know, create new material that has to do with COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for my stand-up, I probably haven't created much for stand-up. I feel like for the 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 short form stuff I do I kind of always find a way to be creative with whatever is in the news so now that there's no sports there's definitely you know corona I guess the one thing that's the same is like if everybody's talking about it I want to be talking about it mm, yeah. so even though that thing changes from day to day I'm kind of always in the conversation because I'm usually up on whatever's happening that day so obviously a larger portion of my you know content has been on corona because that's what's dominating our news cycle yeah. and our daily life you know and then when that's over it'll be back to whatever it was yeah you know? i feel so, like the only things that are happening right now are covid and also the michael jordan documentary absolutely which is just Bruh. like it's the one the, the one uniting thing in all of this just like every sunday Man, night every sunday like, night yes espn probably i mean obviously they, they're going to be hurting right now because there's no live events but as far as like I don't think I would have paid this close of attention to The Last Dance, like making sure I'm watching it as like appointment viewing if this wasn't happening. I absolutely would have watched every episode. Yeah. But I would have watched it on a plane or after a comedy show. Like, So you weren't like a, you weren't a 90s Bulls fan? No, I was. And that's why I think it's so much, so interesting is that like, I, I was a kid, so I wasn't like aware of the contract disputes and the turmoil between. Like I sure. just thought everything was great. They were winning. Like, <laughs> man, like Jerry Cross told Phil Jackson, "You're not going to coach this team no matter what next year." Like, man, why would you do that? He's arguably the best coach of all time. You're like, bro, I hate you, Tim <laughs> Floyd. He's the way. You know what I mean? Like, so getting to hear the other parts of this, you know. This championship and already knowing that they won, like knowing where it ends, but seeing oh, how hard it was. Spoiler there. alert! Come on. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I would pay if you did a Patreon live viewing of the Last Dance with you and your therapist. That would be great. <laughs> Man, this guy is the best ever. He wasn't even my therapist. He was just our guest. He just happened to be a therapist. He's just a fan. But I told him that <laughs> I fired my current therapist. I'm sorry, She's a nice lady. Um, this guy just gets me. One of one of one <laughs> he of tells the, you everything you want to hear. One of <laughs> one, yes, of, yes, one of the other did. one of the other great uh, cultural moments uh, over the last uh, I don't even know how long we've been inside 45, 50 days, whatever it's been, has been uh, the versus battles that Timbaland and Swiss have put on, oh, and, yes. and specifically the Teddy Riley and Babyface one. Uh, I just want to know: Were you there for the first night and the second night? And if so, which one did you prefer? So here's the thing. I was there for both. Teddy Riley follows me. What? On Instagram. Yes. And he's followed me for over a year. So I don't know if you guys saw this, but there was this this uh, uh, Caucasian woman last Christmas. She made a, 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 a rock rendition of No Diggity. And I just like ripped it up. <laughs> Teddy Riley saw it. He, he liked it. He started following me then. Wow. So when I, as a comedian... One of my harshest, hardest parts of my job is knowing I got to go after somebody who I know follows me. It's like the game is the game. Teddy Riley, I hate it had to be you, but the internet comes for all of us. <laughs> so I had to make my video and he like he he uh, he actually shared it on his story. But I feel like the first one was much more. interesting. <laughs> I mean, like if they just if they do it right the first time, it's probably not even as memorable. Not at as all. It is now like. No, part it, of what made it great is it was so awful the first time. Yeah, and then the second time it really delivered. So yeah, we yeah, I had we, nothing else to do, man. Of course, I was <laughs> no, we all got to experience the horribleness together of that first night. Oh, uh, I mean, you and you gotta understand these guys are fifty or almost fifty. <laughs> I know. No, by the way, in a comment, even like, if I you didn't, not, there's no non dumb way to turn your life on in a comment. <laughs> Without looking old, I just did it on a video yesterday. You just look old <laughs> pinning a comment. By the way, so of course, Teddy even Riley, if you didn't tell me that oh he was fifty God. years old, I knew he was fifty years old <laughs> based off of that. Yes, like, it's, like he was. The, 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 the funniest part is, man, 
to him, he was absolutely killing it. Oh, just, my God. Boy, let me tell you who's killing it. <laughs> and, and that's what I think was the funniest part about it. He was not like watching someone think they're doing well and not. It's just oh, comedy. The, the stories that were told two or three times and how they had to react to them again as if it was genuinely finding it out for the first time. Oh, you worked on the show? I know, yeah. How old were you? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was just perfection. Um, Kev, as, as we move forward in uh, what seems like an endless uh, trek through this, this new world, um, how ready are you to stay home for the Ever? next... Yeah, yeah, the next uh, <laughs> bunch of months. How many soup cans do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I feel like I I'm I'm ready. Like I I know the world's opening up very slowly. Even if you could go out and perform to a thousand people, people would not feel comfortable doing that like they did before. Like as an artist, usually your only two hiccups are: do people want to come see you? Are they available? And do they have the money? If they can do all three, they're usually at your show. Mm -hmm. Now they might know you're coming, want to see you have the money, but not feel safe. And who am I to tell somebody, no, it's cool, it's cool. Like, that's just going to take time. Yeah, so yeah. I feel like this is my Jordan moment, the last three years of his career, when he realized he could not just drive and dunk on you like he used to his whole career. He had to develop the fadeaway jumper part of his game. He had to rely on all his knowledge and and, and rely on that and that's what I'm trying to do is develop a different part of my game that I haven't had to do before because they figured out that I cannot can't, I can't go and do stand up live so yeah well listen Kev uh, we'd much rather you be Michael Jordan than be a horse and uh, to that end <laughs> we appreciate you we salute you uh, Kev we send our love to you and yours be safe out there be careful be be creative, uh, and we're looking forward to, uh, after this is all said and done, hopefully we see you on, on your coast or ours, and until then, be well, all right? Thank you, guys. Appreciate you for having me on. Thank you. Shout out to Kev on stage. Shout out to Sylvia O'Bell, and shout out to the one and only Larry Wilmore. Jeff, are we back tomorrow? We are back every day forever. As always, guys, not for real, for real. Sure, sure. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Right.